Gospel chapter number 15. Let me apologize. I mistakenly and gave to Brother Jaron the wrong verse. Amen. That's what happened when you call in the middle of the night. Amen. But amen. It won't take long for us to get on amen, to the right verse. Luke's Gospel chapter number 15. Amen. We actually start with verse number 11. Read from the Message Bible. When you find it, say amen. Yeah, I, I'm serious. I got a couple of man, things going on this morning with man, voice and sinuses and all that stuff. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. Amen. I, I didn't think I had the luxury to call in sick this morning. Yeah. Amen. 
understand because I'm trying to find and teach you all the example. <laughs> Sometimes you got to work through some stuff. Okay, okay, okay. And I hope y'all going to help me work through it. Amen. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 15. I read from the Message Bible, starting with verse number 11. This is what it says. Then he said, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. Let me read that again. Then he said, there once was a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. I want to talk about the gospel of entitlement. Amen. I want to talk to somebody about the gospel of entitlement. First of all, allow me to ask you to forgive me if I offend you by once again taking a text and a journey to that all too familiar passage that I'm sure I preached from at least one time last year, which illustrates what we commonly call the parable of the prodigal son. It is a parable that I believe holds numerous teaching opportunities as we seek to explore the temptation in life to think sometimes that we are ready for the days ahead without first of all having learned the lessons of the days that have gone by. I got plenty of time. Can I take all of it? This, I believe, is a parable that deals with the emotional ebbs and flows of life and the need and desire to find and experience our own personal levels of success. This, I believe, is a parable that deals with issues of personal and private conflict. It is a parable that deals with the issue that all of us are all too familiar with the issue of parental pain, and the issue of sibling rivalry. Are you going to pray with me? It is a parable that deals with the anxiety of sometimes wanting to grow up faster than we're growing and to perhaps even bypass some of the key events and experiences that are so essential to a person's balanced growth and to a person's development. Pray with me, I'm going to take my time, but we're going to get there. It is a parable that teaches us all that it is all right to have wants as long as I never allow those wants to have me. It is a parable that deals with how I see myself it is a parable that deals with how others see me. But most of all, it is a parable of the fact that God knows me. Smile at somebody and say, God knows you. Your ins, your outs, your good days, your bad days, your ups and your downs. Try as much as you might. God does indeed know each and every one of us. Old folk used to say it this way, he made us, and he knows all about us. And sometimes they get happy, and they'd say, he know what we need, even before we ask. My brothers and sisters, as unfortunate as it may seem, most of us are all too familiar with what I call the attitude of entitlement that seemingly has gotten out of control with this current generation. Yeah. I'm glad I got my young adults behind me right now. It is an attitude that expresses great impatience with the developmental stages of life. Nobody wants to sit on the sideline. Everybody wants to get in the game. 
But if you live long enough, you come to realize that a season of sideline learning is often important so that we can learn from other people's mistakes and not have to make the mistakes. Many of us don't remember when Tom Brady was a backup on the sideline. Okay, okay, that'll catch you later on. It is an attitude, an attitude of entitlement that runs around thinking that the world owes me something. It is an attitude that seemingly expresses its selfish desire to get what I want and to want it all right now. And in this particular case, it is an attitude that threatens to destroy the hard work of a father while at the same time disregarding the harmony of the family. For I believe that if properly ad analyzed, this passage provides for us all some beneficial insights into the pressing issue of entitlement. And when I talk about entitlement, let me tell you what I mean. It's defined as a feeling that one has a right to specific benefits and blessings. And it is a feeling that I've got the expectancy that such benefits and blessings are on the way and that I'm entitled to them right here and right now. Entitlements that are deserved are indeed a blessing to the recipient. However, entitlements that are often ill-gotten or prematurely received can turn out to be more than a curse than a blessing. Can I help somebody? If you're not careful, what is designed to bless you can ultimately end up cursing you. You're you going to make me take my time here. Amen. I didn't say I didn't feel good. I said my voice ain't right, but I can I can go with it if you help me. Amen. What is an ultimately designed to be a blessing can be a curse if it comes to you too early. Look at somebody and say, I know what that's talking about. The blessing of marriage can end up being a curse if you get married too soon to the wrong person. Okay, since I got adults in the house up here, the blessing of sexual activity can be a curse. If you get involved too soon, y'all going to make me have to preach up in here. Am I right about it? Well, I believe that if there is one thing that the teaching of the church can do to heal the hurts of mankind and promote the principles of the master, it would be to reinforce the teachings of patience and the practices of faith that make for healthy, happy, and well-balanced lifestyles. Can I help somebody? Most of us are living a life that is totally out of balance. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever driven a car and your tires are not balanced, you'll bounce all over the place. You'll pull to the left when you should be trying to drive straight. Are you praying with me? Uh, Bishop Courtney McBath writes a book entitled Living at the Next Level. And in his book, he reminds us that you don't have to become frustrated with your attempts to get to the next level in life. You will get there. Look at somebody and say, you will get there. But in order to get there, you must make the journey in complete friendship with God. Can I help somebody? You can't be frustrated with God and expect to be blessed. You got to be a friend of God. Can I, can I put it in old people terms? Anyway, you bless me, Lord. I will be satisfied. You got to make sure that you make the journey in complete friendship with God, he says. Take your mind off of the things and place your mind on the God of the things. And God will bring you to your next level in his own time and in his own way. Am I right about it? Or can I put it another way? Be not weary in well-doing. For in due season, you will reap. If you faint not, James reminds us in his writings, patience is designed to have a perfecting effect on the child of God, making you entire and complete, so that in the grand scheme of things, you find yourself lacking nothing. Let me unpack this thing, and I'll be out of your way. The first thing that the son expresses as an attitude of entitlement is an attitude towards the material things of money, goods, and substance that belong to his father 
but had not yet been released to him. Are you praying with me? It's interesting, there is no evidence whatsoever in this text that this son wanted to possess any of the father's core values in life. He didn't say anything about, Daddy, give me your work ethic. He didn't say anything about, Daddy, give me your business and management acumen. He didn't say, Daddy, I'm impressed with your positive character traits. He only asked for his share of what his father has accumulated and accomplished. And as a result, he says, I really want to have your successful lifestyle without having to put in your hard work. Y'all ain't going to pray with me up in here. Too often in life, we meet people who want the results, but don't want to deal with the responsibilities. Y'all help me. I ain't trying to holler up in here today. And I often say to people, the reason why others so desperately covet and crave other people's positions and possessions in life is simply this. We make it look too easy. I dare to look at somebody and say, it looks easy right now. I got my Sunday morning face on. I got my face beat down. I got my hair processed. I, I got my makeup on. I took a bath this morning. It, it looks easy right now, but you have no idea what I had to go through to get to where I am right now. I'm going to need some help in here. People love, fall in love with the perceived glitz and glamour because they never fully see and comprehend the pain and the sacrifice. And in my mind, my mind is even called to take note of the demanding attitude that the son has towards his father. Listen to what he says. The son acts with particular focus on the fact that he is entitled to a particular portion. And he's entitled to receive it right now. You don't believe me. King James Version says, he says, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Listen to the language that the son uses. Father, I already know that one of these old days you're going to fall. And I know that when you fall, your goods are going to fall somewhere. And I already know I don't want to go through the pain and experience of your falling. Therefore, it's my money and I want it right now. Give it to me right now. I, I don't want to wait for your funeral. I don't want to wait for your will to be read. I won't wait for you to pass it down to me. Give it to me right now. Man, oh man. What a rotten way to leave home. And some of y'all ain't saying amen because that's the way you left home. Look at somebody saying, what a rotten way to leave home. New International Version, he says, Father, give me my share of your estate. Message Bible says, Father, I want right now everything that's coming to me. Okay, let me move on. Second thing that the son expresses is an attitude of entitlement towards the psychological things of personal accomplishment, achievement, independence, and pleasure. He wasn't satisfied with life on his level. He wanted to experience life on another level. Listen to what the Bible says. Just a few days later, he gathered He'll be like that. I need to stop right there. It really won't. Hit. I, I never forget. I will forget. I never forget as a child. My older sister, she, she decided she was going to leave home. She was going to run away. She packed the bags up. Amen. Daddy sat there and watched her pack every one of her bags, put everything in a suitcase. When she got ready to go out the door, he looked at her and said, where you going? She said, I'm leaving here. He said, well, what you taking? I'm taking my stuff. He said, hold tight. That's my suitcase. He said, if you're going to leave here, take that stuff out of my suitcase and put it in the paper bag. Of course, you know, my sister never left home. Can I help somebody? He says, a few days later, he gathered his belongings, moved to a far country, and began to waste, watch this, his substance in riotous living, gathering his belongings, moving far away, wasting his substance. These are all byproducts of feeling entitled 
to separation. And these are all byproducts of feeling entitled to independence. These are all byproducts of feeling entitled to self-determination. He's a man now, and he got his own money. Uh, somebody need to buy this sermon for their child. Am I right about it? However, one of the things that you learn in life is this. Just because you have arrived at a season, it does not automatically mean that you're ready for the season that you've arrived at. I wish I had some help here. This lesson was followed, has followed me throughout life and always eventually proves to be true. You got to work hard now in order to be entitled to play hard later on. I'm helping somebody. You got to work hard in January if you're going to have anything laid aside so you can go on vacation in July. Don't be whining to me, I can't take no vacation because I can't afford it. Amen. You got to start putting something away in January. Do I have any help up in here? You got to start exercising in January. If you're going to get in your bikini and your Speedos, ain't nothing worse than a bikini where everything is hanging all over. Okay, okay, okay. okay. You got to put the work in now if you're going to have the look laid on. Do I have a witness? Thank you, Reverend Bobbitt. I needed some help from the preaching section. There is no real success without a real struggle. You ought not to be sitting around waiting for somebody to die and give you something. Am I right about it? Because I found out if you get it too easy, you will not appreciate it. And pretty soon, if you get it easy, you'll turn around and lose it easy. I wish I had some help of me. Can I help you, sisters? That's why you ought not to say yes to everything that come around with a ring in his hand. Just because he got a ring don't mean a thing. He got to be able to prove uh, that you are worth something to him, and he's willing to make the, I ain't going to get no help up in here. Because if he gets you easy, he'll lose you easy. Wish I had some help. <laughs> but there's another somewhat silent thing. That is quietly expressed by the attitude of this son. Hear what I say. The son has an attitude that says that life is often better on my own than it is in my father's house. And that's not always a guarantee in times such as this. Many of us don't realize we live in an age of fatherless homes and homeless fathers. I need, I need a moment for that to sink in. An age where of welcome mats that have seemingly been turned upside down by worlds of hurt that have created cauldrons of confusion. A world where young and old, men and women, are silently screaming, Father me, love me, discipline me, but most of all, forgive me. And give me one more chance. I never forget, I never forget, I never forget the lesson taught to all of his children by, by my daddy. It was a lesson that in essence says, once you feel that you are grown up enough to get out on your own, and you can no longer abide by the rules of this house. Let me try that again. Once you feel like you've grown, and you can no longer abide by the rules of this house. I just want to see if anybody else grew up like I grew up. Let me try it one more time. Once you feel like you're grown and you can no longer, man, somebody ought to take that thing home. Once you feel like you're grown and you can no longer abide by the rules of this house, he told us you better make sure. And in order to be sure that you were ready to leave home, when you got ready to leave home, you had to take your keys and leave them on the kitchen table. Thus signaling that your rights to entitlement were being relinquished and that you were giving up on your right to call 104 56th Street Southeast your home. I thought I'd get some amens right there. But not so with the prodigal son. And not so with every person who calls him or herself a child of God. Because no matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter what the offense or the crime, for the child of God, there will always be a place where he or she can call home. 
Smile at somebody and tell them there's always a place as a child of God where you can call home. There's always a place where you can feel special. There's always a place where the child of God can enter in and feel entitled. And even in his lowest moment, the son was willing to admit that he needed not just to go home, but he needed to be fathered once again. And, and, and can I help somebody? Sometimes it takes a pig pen experience to help us see the error of our ways. I, I, I almost need some truthful folk up in here right now. Is there anybody in here who can remember the pig pen experiences of your life? I know it's 7 o'clock. Y'all don't know anything about that. Anybody willing to admit that you've had some major pig pen experiences in your life? Anybody remember those times when you had to go to bed hungry? I wish I had some help here. Anybody remember those times when you had to beg, borrow, and or steal in order to make your ends meet? Okay, anybody remember the times when you woke up next to somebody who didn't belong in your bed? And did not stay in your life. I dare to look at somebody and tell them I thank God for the blessing of the pig pen experience. Because it helped me to see the error of my ways. Am I right about it? Listen to what the son says. From the pig pen he says, how many of my fathers. I'm going to need some help on this side over there. Hired servants. They have bread enough and some to spare. And yet I'm out here about to perish in my own foolish pride. I'm about to perish in my own hunger. Here's what I know I can do. I will arise and go watch what he said. He didn't say I'm going home. He said I'm going to my father's house. Can I help somebody? If your name ain't on the lease, if your name ain't on the deed, it ain't your home. It's your father's house. I dare to look at somebody. Somebody going to go home and clean house today. Look at somebody and say, your name ain't on the lease. If you didn't mail a payment off this past week to somebody, it ain't your house. It's your father's house. Yeah. Yeah. Slap somebody high five. We'll shout right here at 10 o'clock. Slap somebody high five and say, take back the house. Take back everything in the house. Everything in the house got to get home when I say get home. Everything in the house got to get up when I say get up. Everything in the house got to clean up what I say clean up. If your name ain't on the lease, if it ain't on the deed, it ain't your house. It's somebody else's house. I dare you to go home to that Negro that's laid up beside you and say your name ain't on nothing around here. This ain't your house. This ain't your TV. This ain't your sofa. Don't even touch the refrigerator. Ain't nothing in there that you bought. This is my. Watch what he says. Y'all excuse me, I need a drink right here. Every now and then, you got to realize sometimes you need to go to a place where you can be father. For in the father's house, son knew he could find inclusion. In the father's house, son knew he could find validation. In the father's house, Son knew he could find entitlement. Y'all excuse me today because I get kind of happy just when I stop and think that I have a right, an opportunity, an entitlement to the tree of life. And it's not growing green on somebody else's grass. It's growing pretty green right here in my father's house. Come on, touch somebody and say, come on, go with me to my father's house. There is joy. Can I help somebody? Nothing but peace over there in my father's house. Here's a part of the story that, that, that ought to get some of us happy at least. The Bible says while the son was on his way, while he was yet a long way off, his father saw him. Can I help somebody? When you are a child of God, 
You have the right, you have the authority, you have an entitlement that assures you that whatever you are going through, your father can see it even from afar off. Am I right about it? So that even though you may be going through something right now, your father can see trouble brewing a long way off. And your father can see that you're coming out of this thing even though you know daylight is still a long way off. Look at somebody, smile at him, and tell him the father's in the faith. The mother's in the faith. In fact, you ought to get happy because you got some brothers and sisters in the faith who can see from afar off that you're on your way out of this thing. 2011 was a hell of a year for some of us. But touch somebody and say, father's in the faith. Mother's in the faith. Sisters and brothers in the faith can see you working your way out of that thing. Is there anybody here at 8.30 in the morning that can see you working your way out of that thing? Slap somebody high five and tell them it got rough. I almost gave up. I almost threw in the towel. But I thank God for somebody who could see me from afar and knew that I was on my way up out of that. For the gospel, the gospel of entitlement says, first of all, you got three things and I'm out of here. First of all, the gospel of entitlement says you have the right to the open arms of the Father. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter who you've been through. This parable teaches us that the arms of the Father are always open to his children. Even if he or she has been considered to be prodigal. It dawned on me, it dawned on me, it dawned on me. We've been, we've been calling him the prodigal son for many days and years of our lives. And many of us have not stopped to take a moment to think just what prodigal means. Prodigal means that he engaged in a lavish, wasteful, extravagant, reckless, and somewhat careless lifestyle. Take a moment, let that sink in. Take a moment, let that sink in. Come on, look at somebody and say, lavish, wasteful, extravagant, reckless, somewhat careless lifestyle. Okay, Reverend, the truth of the matter is all of us have had proclivities towards the prodigal at one time or another in our lives. The son had been prodigal, but he still belonged to the father. The son had been among pigs, but he still belonged to the father. The son had been with prostitutes. Don't you make me feel like preaching up in here. But he still belonged to the father. Let this be a lesson to somebody, a lesson that you don't hear too often in church. A lesson for those who consider themselves to be experienced saints. Who may be sitting next to somebody who knows all too well the experience of sin. There is nothing that you could ever do that would cause the father to disown you. Church folk may disown you. Friends may disown you. So-called loved ones may disown you. But touch some mind and say, there's nothing that you could ever do that would cause the father to disown you. You ought to live every day with the joy of that knowledge. Because when you don't feel that you will receive anything but criticism from church folk, you're always entitled to the open arms of the Father. A am I right about it? I remember the songwriter saying when I was a little child, red and level, black and white, all of us are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. But that's not all. That's not all. Secondly, you, the gospel of entitlement also says that you have the right to restoration. I got a right to open arms. I got a right to restoration. Now I want you to see this because in the life of certain people, you don't always get a second chance. And if somebody here right now ought to be shouting and giving God praise for your second chance. Am I right about it? You better learn to thank God for a second chance. Because sometimes so-called people won't give you a second chance. Especially if it seems that life has knocked you flat on the ground. 
But look at somebody and say, if I've been knocked flat on the ground, you got to understand the ground that I've been knocked flat on does not belong to you. I got knocked down on the Lord's ground. And if God decides to pick me up, he'll pick me up. Whether you like it or not. Am I right about it? That's why I praise God that in the Lord my final destination is not determined. I wish I felt like preaching up in here. My final destination is not determined by the leaders in the church. My final destination is determined by the love of Christ. What can separate me from the love of Christ? Look at something and say, I am persuaded that nothing will separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Therefore, you ought to tell somebody you may not know what I've been through, but at least you ought to act like you know the one who's brought me through. Because can I say in one of my favorite scriptures, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I don't know where I would be. And because the Lord is on your side, you can expect that the gospel of entitlement gives me the right to restoration. Watch this. The best road. You didn't hear what I said? The biggest ring. The best steak dinner. There's nothing too good for a child of God. Look at somebody and say, don't hate on me. Because the Lord has made stuff good for me. I've had my bad days. I've had my rough times. I've been through hell and high water. But don't hate on me now because now I'm a child of God. And I come to the realization that there's nothing too good for the child of God. That's why the Bible says there's more, there's more rejoicing in heaven when one person gets saved than 99 who come to church every Sunday morning. Especially when you have lived a life of sin and you come over to a life of salvation. When you give your life to the Lord, when you make your way back to the Lord. When you turn your everything over to Jesus, look at somebody and say, get ready for a season of restoration. Get ready to experience God's best. Get ready because you already know that the rest of your days are going to be the best of your days. Do I have a witness in here? How do you know that? Talk to me, Jeremiah. He says, I know the plans I have for you. Says the Lord, plans to do you good and not evil. Plans to prosper you and give you an expected end. That's why the saint of God, you don't have to wait till the battle is over. You can shout right now because you can already expect that in the win, you're going to win. Tell somebody, I already expect that in the end, after I've gone through what I've gone through, I know I'm going to win. Do I have any winners in the house? Do I have any overcomers in the house? Do I have any champions in the house? Touch somebody and say, I know I'm going. And there's one more thing. Y'all excuse me. I, 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 I'll feel better next Sunday. There's one more thing that the gospel of entitlement gives you. It gives you the right to a celebration of your salvation. I saw be tuning right here. I ain't going to be able to do it. Touch somebody and say, your salvation ought not to be minimized. Your salvation ought not be ignored. Your salvation ought not be a secret. Time is running out for secret saint society. If you've been born again, you ought to let somebody know you've been born again. If you sit here every Sunday morning, we can't tell you've been born again on Sunday morning. Then I sure enough know you're not going to let anybody know you've been born again on Friday night. Am I right about it? Because real salvation ought to be celebrated. That's why we get happy on Sunday morning. I can't do it, but I feel like doing it. Look at somebody and say, that's why we get happy. That's why we run around. That's why we dance and shout. Because real salvation... If the Lord has bought you out of anything, your salvation ought to be celebrated. Am I right about it? That's why the Father said, let us eat. Let us be merry. Let us celebrate. Because my son, he was thought to be dead. But now he's here 
and a lie. My son, he was thought to be lost, but now he's here and he's been found. And what I like most about the father, he didn't let anybody, not even his other son, hinder or hate on the salvation and the celebration of his son's salvation. Tell somebody the decision to bless me. It does not belong to you. No, you didn't hear what I said. Tell somebody the decision to bless me. Come on, man. I feel like trying it, man. The decision to bless me. It does not belong to you. It belongs exclusively to my father. Because the Bible says that the older son, when he came home, he called one of his servants and asked him, what does the celebration mean? I think I need to tell somebody that everybody that's in the house is not necessarily in line with the vision of the Father. Everybody is not going to celebrate uh, what the Lord has done for you. That's why I thank God that he's not going to let anybody interfere with the celebration that I am entitled to. A day to shake somebody's hand, look them in the eye, and tell them after all the stuff you went through last year, and you made it this year, you are entitled to a celebration. After all the time, the devil tried to knock you down, and you got back up again. Tell somebody you are entitled to a celebration. I got to close now, y'all. But before I close, I need to tell somebody, if you know you've been born again, let me check the house. Is there anybody in here that know you've been born again? Is there anybody in here that know you've been saved by grace? Is there anybody, anybody in here that know you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Well, uh, you ought not to have any issue about anybody else uh, celebrating. Uh, let them scream if they want to scream. Uh, let them shout if they want to shout. Let them run if they want to run. In fact, you ought not to oppose a celebration. You ought to co-sponsor the celebration. Uh, would you hug somebody and tell them I'm not opposing? You're praising God. But I'm here to help you celebrate. In fact, not only will I co-sponsor, I'll co-sign. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God. I thank God. I Tell somebody, celebrate like you're entitled to celebrate. Celebrate like you're glad to celebrate. Celebrate like you know it's yours. Celebrate like you know the Father is happy. Celebrate like you know you get joy, joy, joy. When I think about what the love. You are entitled. Every, every deacon, y'all, spread across the front. Just, just spread across the front. Spread across the front. Spread across, all the way across the front. All the way, all way across the front. One end to the other. One end. One end to the other. Man, I wish I felt like it. I wish I felt like it. I wish I felt like it. Look at somebody and say, you don't know like I know what the law. If you hear my brother, my sister, 
you I entitled to the open arms. I want to see if they're paying attention to me. You I entitled to the open arms of fathers, mothers. I want nobody to miss this. You I entitled. to the open arms. Arms that are stretched wide. Can I help somebody? When I stretch my arms wide, I leave myself vulnerable. You can't be a leader in God's church if you're not willing to be vulnerable. You are entitled to the open arms of fathers and mothers in the faith. Don't you join a church where you don't see open arms. Don't you join a church where you got to qualify for membership. Don't you join a church where you got to feel as you got to hide the fact that you've been through some stuff. Because you are entitled to the open arms of loving fathers. Man, I feel God in this place. You are entitled to restoration. You are entitled to the best. It is our responsibility to offer you the best that the church of the living God has to offer. Not just Christ. Yes, we offer you Christ. But we also offer you the best of what we have in a ministry. The best seats in the house. We're so trained that can't nobody sit up front but, but deacons and deaconesses. You didn't get that from me. You are entitled to the best seat. In fact, in fact, you go sit down to breakfast. You ought not to sit in the corner by yourself. You are entitled to the best meal. You are entitled to the best robe. The best ring. And you are entitled to our celebration of your salvation. I thank God. I thank God. I, I struggled with this for a little while, but I thank God. I thank God that he doesn't allow us to accomplish what we want. Because if we do what we want every time we want to do it, then we'd be celebrating the fact that we got a new kitchen. We'd be celebrating the fact that we got new vans and we got new pews. And, but that's not what the church ought to be about. We ought to be celebrating the fact that we got new brothers and sisters in Christ. Come on. Come on. You are entitled to the open arms. Come on. You are entitled to restoration. Regardless of where you've been, what you've done. That's not ours to question. You're entitled to a season of celebration. 